The Charles Adler Show starts now. So I want to ask people to forgive me if I screw up on something very, very important in the conversation that I'm about to have with with a Canadian senator for many years while she was uh, doing incredible journalism columns, you name it, with the Edmonton Journal and uh, in Western Canada, one of the, the, the best known journalists, especially in Alberta. Uh, we became friends and of course, uh, friends call each other by their first name and I, I would just call her Paula, but she's a senator. So occasionally I may slip and call her Paula, as in Paula Simons, as opposed to Senator Simons, but I'll try to behave myself and keep addressing the senator as a senator because it was a very, very, in, in my opinion, uh, terrific decision uh, to make uh, Paula Simons a senator. She's part of the Independent uh, Caucus, and this week she was asking about a very, very sensitive issue that many people simply won't want to touch, and I'm just uh, thrilled that uh, she's coming on to uh, discuss it with us uh, because it is an issue that is close to her heart, mine, and no doubt uh, many hearts that are listening and watching right now. This is about unsealing information on the Holocaust file. Many people in this country uh, either committed war crimes, I can't say committed war crimes because I have to have more specific evidence to to, to do that, but they certainly served with Nazi forces uh, that were involved in the war crimes in Europe uh, against uh, Jews and others. Uh, This is the Holocaust we're talking about. We're also giving you context, of course. It's the guest uh, who got far too prominence uh, during an important session of the House two weeks ago. Uh, It was in the Yom Kippur period, which is the holiest period on the Jewish calendar, whether you're religious or not. Uh, It's an important part of the year. And so this was insulting, insulting to Jews and insulting to someone who has Jewish heritage, which is Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, who was being honored. Um, This gave Canada a black eye, even today, on this day, and we're uh, doing this on uh, Thursday, October 5th, uh, Vladimir Putin, uh, who got a great propaganda points out of all this. Uh, Today, he too condemned Canada uh, for this um, insult. So without further ado, let me bring on uh, Senator Paula Simons in Ottawa. Uh, Senator, it's uh, great to have you on the show. You're allowed to call me Paula. It's okay. (laughs) Well, uh, once in a blue moon, I'll go to Paula, but, but, but before we do that, I want to ask you, first of all, for your reaction to what happened and what you and many other good people are trying to do about enlightening Canadians, because clearly enlightenment was, it was a big deal. You had the uh, Speaker of the House uh, saying that he thought it was okay to have this guy there because uh, he said that he was fighting the Russians, uh, the Speaker forgetting that we weren't fighting the Russians. Uh, We were allied with the Russians. The Russians were fighting the Nazis. That helped the entire free world, regardless of what the Soviet Union was, regardless of what it was before the war and after the war. During the war, they were very much a very critical ally in the effort to defeat Nazism. So that was a clear example. If the speaker doesn't really get what was happening and not happening in World War II, uh, some education is necessary, and I think you're you're part of that effort, and that's why I've, I've got you here on the show. So, uh, just a very broad question: what 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 you're doing? What is it all about? Give us the the grander context for why Canadians need information that the government has in its vaults to be unsealed as soon as possible. Well, thank you very much, Charles, for having me back on. I always love chatting with you, but this is actually. A story that has like it's like two rivers that came together to form one. So let's start with what happened when President Zelensky was here in Ottawa. I was not in the chamber that day. I had to go home for family reasons, uh, and we had we had, we weren't given advance notice that uh, President Zelensky was coming. So only some senators sort of made it to the chamber. But when I heard this idea that they were honoring somebody who fought the Russians. I had two thoughts. I remember, you know, in George Orwell's 1984, where the propaganda machine is always saying, you know, we have always been at war with Eurasia. And I thought, you know, we, we, we overuse the term Orwellian. And this was Orwellian in a different sense, in the sense that now that we're, you know, now that Russia is in our bad books, we, you know, it's very easy for people to forget history. But the other thing that really occurred to me is 
the danger of not knowing history. Now, for you and for me, this is an easy question because this is our history. This is our family history. Um, as, as people may or may not know, uh, my family roots are all in Ukraine, but nobody was Ukrainian. My father's family are, are Jewish. My mother's family were German, Volga Deutsch, who lived in Ukraine. And so I had family members, distant family members, who were killed in the Holocaust in Ukraine, massacred at Poltava. And I also had German relatives who were inducted into the German army. And my own grandfather, Jakob Dick, who was a Mennonite and a pacifist um, and an ethnic German, was forced to fight in the Wehrmacht and died on the Russian front. So this history is in my blood. It is curled up in my DNA. So to me, it was initially incomprehensible that somebody as prominent as Speaker Rhoda would not have remembered that, you know, the, the people fighting the Russians in 1943 were the Nazis. So, you know, I, 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 I'm feeling very lucky that I wasn't in the House of Commons as everybody stood to give Mr. Hunka a standing ovation, because in a moment like that, if I had sat down and stayed in my seat, as I think I probably ought to have done had I been there, you run the real risk of looking like you're not supporting Ukraine today and that you're in Putin's pocket. So I dodged that one. But what I'm actually doing started in a different place. I was approached, I believe, in August, long before this Zelensky embarrassment, by B'nai B'rith Canada, who asked me if I would consider sponsoring or speaking to their idea. You know, they, they would like to have a, a Senate public bill, which is what we call our private members bill equivalents here, brought to ask for changes to the Access for Information Act to make open Canada's Holocaust records. Not just the records of uh, potential war criminals who came in the 40s and 50s, but also the records of what the Mackenzie King government was doing to keep Jews out in the 1930s. And so B'nai B'rith and I, you know, had initial conversations about this via email weeks and weeks and weeks ago. And then after this terrible embarrassment with Mr. Hunka in the gallery, um, it was just coincidental timing that we, we already had a meeting booked uh, to talk about this. And for me, I was a journalist for 30 years. Access to information and transparency is incredibly important to me. I was also a popular historian. I've, I've, I've co-written books of history. I've done long form history documentaries. And so to me, access to history and access to our archival records is something that I think researchers and academics should be able to have. And then there's a, a third and final piece of this, which is that in 1987, um, the Duchen Commission released a report about allegations that people with ties to the Nazis, to the SS, had been not just allowed into Canada, but welcomed with open arms. And the Duchenne Commission report came in two parts, one which was public and one which was private, redacted, and has never been released. And so the question is, you know, absolutely, we need to open the records for what happened in the 1930s and 40s. And then the more sensitive question is, what do we do with the uh, confidential part of the Duchenne Commission report, which could out people who maybe were not Nazis, but who were named and alleged to be and never had the chance to clear their name. Weren't Nazis necessarily, but were likely in the same boat as the person you've named him a couple of times. I don't wish to give him any more prominence, so I'm not going to be naming him that you, you can do whatever you want. Uh, you're a senator, you're a free person, uh, you're a trained journalist, and if you feel it's useful to name him, go ahead. But I don't want to name him. I'm just wondering if uh, what's in those documents is more names of people like that with that particular background. I'd have a hard time believing uh, that um, the, the the names in the documents have nothing to do with the war effort against uh, the Russians, the war effort on the side of Hitler. Yeah, you know, but I think it's important, and because you have Eastern European roots, because this is your family story, Yes, you understand the complexity of this, because your family suffered at the hands of the Nazis and also at the hands 
of of the Soviet communists. Just to make it clear, the 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 same people who this person who I don't wish to name served that organization uh, was responsible for the death of many members of my family. That organization, the SS, ran the concentration camps where some members of my family and extended family were murdered and others were murdered in other ways that I don't, I don't wish to, um, to describe. Yeah. So we have a conundrum because clearly anybody who was a Nazi, anybody who enthusiastically joined the SS, that's one category of person. The other category of person are people who were young and stupid and perhaps forced to serve in the German army without any, any option, or perhaps having undergone incredible persecution by the Stalinist government, having survived the Holodomor, the Soviet engineered famine in Ukraine, they, they honestly but mistakenly believed that fighting on the side of the Germans would help to defeat Stalin and free Ukraine. So, you know, it, of course, uh, this is not in any way to exonerate anybody who committed a war crime. But I think we have to understand that there was a spectrum of moral darkness. And we can't just assume that just because somebody wore a German uniform or even an SS uniform, that they were involved in war crimes as opposed to fighting in a war on the opposite side to the allies. And this is, this is the delicacy of calling for the release of the Deschen Commission documents right now. Because right now, Russia is invading Ukraine and Russia is claiming that Ukraine is a fascist Nazi state, despite the fact that it has a Jewish president. And we do have to turn a little bit carefully he, because we don't want to give aid and comfort to Putin. We don't want to play into his narrative that all Ukrainians are Nazis because that's patently false. And also, you know, it, 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 it makes us useful idiots in Russia's propaganda campaign. All that said, we can't be afraid to have hard conversations amongst Ukrainian Canadians and Jewish Canadians about how together we understand and examine that history with all the nuance with all the subtlety without painting everybody in black and white understanding that those territories you know sometimes called the bloodlands um that there were many many different shades of gray some darker than others so senator uh, i've got some gray here in this conversation forgive me if i'm missing important points that you're making but i'm trying to figure out whether or not you're making an argument, and then you're doing the on the other hand business, which is which is fine, <laughs> like Tevye, I mean, like Tevye the milkman. Yeah, right. But, so, so you know, as I think it was Harry Truman who once said, you know, all, all the economists were doing well on the one hand. The other hand, the Harry Truman said, I think I need a one-handed economist. So I'm not looking for a one-handed senator or a one-handed person uh, to advocate uh, for releasing all the documents. But I am trying to nail down whether or not Senator Simons wants the documents released or doesn't want the documents released? No, I certainly want all the documents that pertain to the pre-war and war period released. I mean, that should be axiomatic. And not just released, but made accessible. Because this is what B'nai B'rith is asking for too. Because it's one thing to say, oh, well, they're not private, but if you can't get at them, if they're not indexed, if they're not digitized, they're kind of useless. So I'm absolutely calling for that. With the Deschen Commission, I think, I'm, I think what I'm calling for is for there to be a really serious consideration of releasing it, perhaps with necessary redactions of individual names. Because I think if we don't understand what happened and how it happened, we are doing ourselves and our, and our, our children and grandchildren a disservice. I mean, the most prominent Nazi war criminal who was invited to North America was Werner von Braun who was the father of the American space program and who ran rocket programs in Germany. And he used slave labor um, and, and, you know, countenanced terrible things. Whether he did them or not, they happened in, you know, under his direction and in his name. The Americans could not wait to bring him to America to help work on the space program. So he is the most prominent and the most, you know, He's the inspiration for the character in Dr. Strangelove. 
Um, people know that story. What we don't know is how many people came here, how many people who were involved with this Galician SS unit, people who were full up, paid up, you know, Nazi true believers who engaged in war crimes, how many who came had Nazi sympathies, but were um, allowed in after the war, and how many were deluded young men who very, you know, who were cogs in a machine and had very little free will in deciding what they were going to do. And so I think the Deschen report should be released, but I think perhaps with necessary redactions to make sure that we're not being played for patsies by, by Vladimir Putin in this moment either. So, Senator, um, let me ask a, a, a blunt question. I now uh, have as many hands as an octopus. But. Well, I, I, I need to ask a, a pretty blunt question here. Um, if I were a young Nazi in Ukraine, okay, and I was like others who enthusiastically joined the Waffen-SS because there were many who were enthusiastic about uh, getting in. Uh, there were many more people applying uh, than were taken. Um, the Nazis wanted people who were coming in to do that kind of work to be enthusiastic. So I just want to ask, how difficult would it be for someone who was a uh, young Nazi joining the Waffen-SS to be telling a senator at some inquiry today that he really wasn't enthusiastic. He was just caught up in uh, trying to defend his people from, from Russians who had uh, committed the whole of the war and that he really wasn't after Jews or after other civilians. Uh, he just wanted to fight the Russians and he was, uh, he was uh, somewhat naive in, in doing what he was doing, but his heart was in the right place. How difficult would it be for some elderly man today to say, that's the guy you're talking about? Well, I mean, it would be, I imagine that would be the easy self-serving thing for anybody to say. But I think you've, what you've really put your finger on is the whole other part of this, which is the Descent Commission happened 37 years ago. And the, the number of people still living who, were, who testified at that commission or were uh, named in, in the allegations of, of uh, Nazi sympathies and Nazi actions, I'm vanishingly few of them are still alive. And so I think at a certain point you have to say, maybe it's after 25 years, maybe it's after 30 years, maybe it's after 50 years, I don't know, that these documents have to be made public. They can't be kept private forever. The question is how we release them in the most useful way, because we're not going to be bringing anybody to justice. There's no question that we're going to go out now and prosecute and extradite, uh, you know, somebody who's 102. That's, that's, that's a, a meaningless and at this point malicious action. The reason to make these documents public is to understand how seemingly normal, not evil men became seduced by Nazism. Because guess what? I, you know, look outside your windows these days. And there are plenty of young men who fit that same profile being seduced into right-wing extremism. And so I think the, the value of this isn't to go back and find, you know, these altakakers and say, you know, you were a bad man 80 years ago. I want to see what's the, what's the, you know, what's the, what's the forensic analysis of the psychology of somebody who gets caught up in a right-wing movement. And I think that would be more edifying for us today to think about, all right, what do we do in the face of extremism when people are desperate, when people are angry, when people feel aggrieved? What is it that, that takes people from you know, seemingly normal people to do acts of unspeakable evil or to countenance acts of unspeakable evil? That's the value of studying history, not to go back with a scorecard and settle debts, but to understand why seemingly ordinary humans, just like the ones, you know, walking Canadian streets today, could be seduced into doing things that were so horrific. Just to buttress uh, your point about authoritarianism, and then I want to move on to a, a, a different question about uh, our government and, and its responsibilities and uh, I, don't, I don't think you'll be saying that our government was somehow uh, seduced. Uh, there were uh, cold-hearted 
um, calculations made. Uh, some of them were recommended by the British, but I want to get into that. But just to buttress your point about authoritarianism, The Economist is out right now, a very credible magazine, yes. uh, with a survey indicating that approximately 15%, so the number could be higher, but based on the survey, 15% of young Americans are telling The Economist that they prefer authoritarianism, that they don't uh, believe in democracy. My guess is, and I hope I'm wrong, my guess is it's significantly higher than 15%, but I think this is one of these questions where many people who feel uh, anti-democratic, I'm not talking about the Democratic Party, I'm talking about democracy, many people who feel that way may not want to tell uh, a surveyor that, may, may not want to admit that democracy is something they, they don't believe in and maybe they're willing to try something else. And I say this only because of the incredible enthusiasm for Donald Trump. Uh, yeah. you've, you've got tens of millions of people, perhaps as many as 70 million, enthusiastic about Donald Trump. Surely to God, uh, Senator Simons, they're not enthusiastic about Donald Trump because Donald Trump is the epitome of uh, someone who fights for, for democracy. Let no, me... you know, I, I have this conversation with my husband over and over again, and he, okay. says, he says, how... You know, he's so stupid. He's so cruel. How can people like him? And I said, that's the point. The cruelty is the point. The, 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 you know, the playing to people's most base instincts is the model. That, that's, the, that's the feature, not the bug. And, you know, I've just been listening to a really interesting podcast series on, on fascism in Britain and the rise of Sir Oswald Mosley. And, you know, listening to the, the historian's unpack what was it that brought Mosley to prominence and then why didn't fascism take hold in in Great Britain when there was plenty of racism and plenty of anti-Semitism and plenty of concern about the economy. And I think, you know, at some level, I think we all do ourselves, uh, I think we're fooling ourselves if we think that somehow if we'd been back in time, we would have been necessarily immune to the lure of simple solutions. I don't mean I don't mean you and me, but I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, there were listen, I mean, Mackenzie King, we don't call him a war criminal. How much blood is on his hands for an immigration policy that refused, absolutely refused to let Jews into Canada in, you know, in the in the in the 1930s? Um, and how much responsibility do we assign to the Canadian government post-war, which was quite happy to welcome people who'd fought against Stalin with the Nazis, because at that point there was a red scare. And if you could claim that you were an anti-communist, that got you, uh, that got you in the door. Well, Canada didn't just admit uh, those people who were fighting uh, Stalin and uh, joined the Nazis. They also admitted people uh, who were fighting with the Nazis. Uh, so that's part of what you're wanting to expose by, by exposing the, the, the records of yeah. what Canada brought in, who they brought in, and why. Yeah, because, I mean, you know, I'd, I'd rather, rather than figuring out which 18-year-old was just, you know, a, a rule, an order follower with a gun and which 18-year-old was a psychopath, I think it's a better question to ask which civil servants in Ottawa decided it was a great idea to let these guys in. I mean, that's, that to me is a much more telling question uh, about, about the other learning we can take away from this commission is, you know, what do we do now? I mean, because we're faced with this same question all the time. We get people applying for immigration or refugee status here from unsavory regimes all around the world, in every single corner of the world. And how do we decide which Rwandans we let in, which uh, Burmese we let in, because one person's freedom fighter is another person's terrorist. One person's, you know, leader is another person's genocidal dictator. So uh, well, well, these, are, these are Simon, questions but, Canada's going to be faced but, with but, but, but let's, let's for a be long realistic, time. Let's be realistic, because I don't want to play the role of the naive Canadian. I've had enough of the naive Canadian. So uh, when someone from one of those genocidal regimes applies for refugee status, they know that the first thing they have to say to Canadian authorities is, I'm against that, and I'm, I'm threatened by that. Because unless you say that, you don't get to come to Canada. And the idea, once again, I don't want to be the naive Canadian, the idea that we're doing forensic analysis of all of those people and trying to figure out exactly where they're coming from and trying to determine whether or not they're telling us the truth, once again, I would have to be a naive Canadian to believe that we're spending serious amounts of money uh, genuine resources 
getting genuine analysis, hiring private detectives to find out whether or not we're being told the truth. Yeah, you know, and then I remember, oh, must be 30 years ago when I was a young journalist at the Edmonton Journal, um, and I was writing a lot on immigration issues. I remember this one family, they were from Latin America, and they'd sought sanctuary in a church because they were facing deportation. And they had a bunch of little kids. And one of those little kids had a heart condition and had been born in Canada. And it was a whole thing. The church was raising money for them. And I went and interviewed them all. Well, I mean, the guy was an alleged member of a death squad. And I said to him, you know, uh, it's alleged that you were a member of a death squad. And he said, I didn't have any choice but to be a member of a death squad. I, either I either I joined the death squad or they would have killed me and my family. He ended up being deported. I don't know what happened to him and his children. But every single person has a complicated story. And I don't envy the people on, uh, you know, who are evaluating refugee claims. I mean, what do you do with somebody who says, yes, I was a member of a death squad, but they made me do it? Uh, because it seems plausible to me that they would have killed him if he hadn't picked up a gun. And yet, uh, of all the people who are waiting in line to come to Canada, do you want death squad guy? I'm guessing we don't. I, but I'm not, I'm not what I mean is these, 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 questions are, these questions are not so easy. But Senator Simons, I'm not trying to disparage uh, anybody uh, who uh, wants to uh, save uh, their lives, save the lives of their children and be in camp. I'm not, not disparaging it. And I don't have the evidence. But when you do talk to people who have done serious analysis of historical events, and it's not just Germany and it's not just Ukraine, but all over the world, generally people who join special forces and so-called elite forces have to demonstrate an enthusiasm yep. for the business that they're going to be involved in. Yep, yep, and yep. every time, every time they're caught and every time they're caught out, they always say, I had no choice. I was just following orders, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm just, I'm, I'm, like I say, I, 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 I want people to be able to live in Canada uh, and not be persecuted, and I want them to have their, their families uh, get the, you're talking about the heart condition, uh, to get the, the best possible medical access and all the rest of it. But once again, I don't want to be the naive Canadian and pretend that we don't have many people in this country from all over the world yep. who have participated in, in some uh, rather nefarious activity and, 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 and offer the excuse that they had no choice. Let me ask about uh, a specific here, going back to what you're talking about, the public service. Um, what is it that you expect to find uh, from what the Canadian government did after the war? And the reason I ask is because as someone who both of us know and many Canadians know, uh, to be an honest man, a good man, a human rights advocate all over the world, and someone who's a former uh, justice minister in the government of Canada, and I'm talking specifically about Erwin Cochler, who's the head of the yeah. Raoul, Raoul uh, Wallenberg Institute, uh, and, 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 and someone who is respected around the world uh, by, by human rights advocates everywhere. And he said very bluntly just days ago that after the war, it was easier to get into this country if you were a Nazi than a Holocaust survivor. Erwin Kotler uses his words, chooses his words extremely carefully. Is that what you're after right now, Senator Simons? Well, it, I mean, are you after I, information to, to back up what, what Mr. Kotler's saying? I, I hadn't heard him saying that. I mean, intuitively, I'm guessing that's right. I mean, the Mackenzie King government was virulently anti-Semitic. So would it shock me if he were correct? It would not shock me. But the thing is, until until that document is made public, we're all just speculating. I mean, I, I was asked by CTV, you know, what I would want to see redacted from the report. And I said, I don't know because I haven't seen the report. Uh, it, it just seems to me that 37 years after the fact, with almost everybody who would be named in that report, you know, passed on, that the question, as I say, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to send hit squads after 98-year-old men, but I think we have to be honest about what this means about us as Canadians, that we made these public policy choices. Senator Simons, um, how difficult is it? Because it just seems that when we're talking about government, Everything takes a long time. For a while, it took us a long time just to get passports, okay? Passports are not as sensitive as getting records of what Canada did and didn't do in the Holocaust period. So 
the, what, what we're talking about, it, 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 you know, under the best possible scenario, even if we got more freedom to access these files, how long would it take? How old would we be oh, by the time this actually happens? You know, I have to tell you, Charles, when I joined the Senate, I'd worked as a daily newspaper reporter. And before that, I was, you know, the director of a live morning radio talk show. I'm used to things happening in real time right. on daily deadline. Uh, things in the Senate don't work that way. And things in Ottawa don't work that way. No kidding. So, you know, <laughs> so understand that these archival records, as far as I know, have not been digitized. Um, you know, and, and we're not going to release a bunch of, you know, brown crinkled paper. So, you know, archivists have to go through these documents and, you know, and preserve them and digitize them. So, I mean, even with the best will in the world, there are physical things that have to be done to make the older records accessible. The Duchenne De Commission is not, you know, handwritten on, on parchment. It's, it would have been right. typed, um, I guess, in 1987. Maybe it was even, you know. Senator Simons. Computer who, printed. But, but yeah, but, you know, it is, putting, I, putting I, aside, I can't answer this question, so I'm just well, treading putting, water. All right, putting aside, okay, I, I, take, I take your response. But putting aside the, the quality of the paper and whether it's papyrus or, or paper or, or digital, okay, putting that aside, who makes the decision? Because people are so vague these days. On, on government and, and who really runs the government or r runs all aspects of government. So let me just ask a very, very specific question. Does the Prime Minister make the decision whether or not to unseal the documents which will absolutely no doubt uh, bring great shame uh, to the Canadian government of the 1940s? Well, I mean, that is one way to do it. Um, I, I it's a fair question because I don't know that he can do that unilaterally. I mean, what B'nai B'rith is asking for is an amendment to privacy legislation to make so that it also so that this is not a one off. I mean, what they want is to see a rule that after 25 years, everything has to be made public. So that is something hypothetically. I'm still talking to B'nai B'rith, but say, for example, that I sponsored such a bill, it would have to be voted on in the Senate, it would have to be voted on in the House of Commons. Um, and then, you know, is it the National Archives of Canada that would do the actual work of making those documents public? I mean, it isn't just a question of, you know, can the Prime Minister wiggle his nose and make it, make it so. Um, it's also possible that they could add this to the budget, which is, I think, the other... Um, Thing that B'nai B'rith is looking for those those, those omnibus budget bills. Um, you stick it in there, and then it and then it just gets voted on along. Well, you're with, you're revealing a, a lot of us, uh, you know, we're, we're insiders, quasi insiders, uh, whatever we are, we're, we're we're somewhat connected to to this kind of knowledge. But you've just revealed a a little secret. I want you to expand upon this. I don't think many people uh, understand how if you're you 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 can tuck things in and things are genuinely tucked yeah. into so-called omnibus bills. I wonder if you could give us a quick primer on that. Yeah, I think the last time I made a speech in which I denounced omnibus bills, I called it a turducken legislation. Um, so nobody wants to vote against the budget. The budget is a confidence motion. So if you vote against the budget in the House, then the government falls. And right now, uh, the Democrats don't want that to happen. Um, so, you know, budgets pass. Similarly, when the budget gets to the Senate, the Senate, uh, respectful of the will of the elected parliament and mindful that its actions could also bring down the government, senators also vote in favor of the budget. And so the last budget included a re for just for one, one of many examples, it included a, a revamping of the Air Passenger Bill of Rights, which has nothing to do with the budget. <laughs> so, I mean, governments do this when they, they, just, they want a clean house, they want things to go through quickly, they don't want to have a lot of debate, or you know, they don't want to spend two years writing its own standalone bill. So they stuff things in. Um, and then even if you may object to one part of the budget, uh, strenuously. You don't vote against the budget because then you're behaving, you know, like an American uh, congressperson who wants to shut down the government. We, we tend to pass the money bills so that we don't have government shutdowns. But governments are very, very naughty. And I must say, I have never, you know, as far as I can recall in my career as a journalist, this is not like this 
this is not something that Justin Trudeau invented. Uh, governments have been doing this for decades. Right. So while it, it doesn't flatter democracy, this is one way to get this yep. done. Well, you see in there, it's see, and there's my hypocrisy, right? If I want it done quickly, I say, oh, I'll put it in a budget bill and then it'll go, you know, but this is, this is the problem. You start larding so much stuff on, you forget what you were actually voting on in the first place. All right. Senator Simons, I can't thank you enough for this, and I hope we can do this more frequently. That would be lovely. I now have to, uh, to say goodbye. I think I'm the last person left in the Senate building. The Senate rose. Uh, we, started, we started recording it uh, at 5 o'clock Eastern, and it's now 5.40, and I think it's just the security guards and me. So. As long as, long as they as long as they let you out, I, I as long as they let me out again, it should be fine. Right. Well, everybody in Alberta knows about your strong work ethic, and now everyone in Canada does as well. Uh, and by the way, thank you for allowing me to call you Paula, my friend. Always take care, Charles. Senator Paula Simons in Ottawa. Thank you very much for joining us on this show and every show. Thanks for telling your friends. This is the podcast that also features at least two or three times a week, or whenever the spirit moves me, uh, three minutes that matter, which is my take on the news, the highly relevant news. And as always, it's tough for me to even clear my throat without an opinion. So if you like sharp opinions, terrific. Uh, I've said before in the past to, to friends, uh, to listeners, to viewers, to readers, um, if nuance and subtlety is your cup of tea, don't drink my commentaries. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Charles Adler. Catch Charles Adler Mondays on Real Talk with Ryan Jesperson, twice a week in the Winnipeg Free Press, and every day at choirmedia.ca.